A lot of eyes on Michigan tonight, where Democrats and Republicans are holding presidential primaries. Now, the polls closed in all but four Michigan counties just moments ago, and we're going to be watching over the next hour for updates from our decision desk for the latest numbers and possible projections. We're standing by for those any moment now. And on the Republican side, this is the second time in four days that former President Donald Trump has faced off against Nikki Haley, who he beat in Iowa. New Hampshire, Nevada, and her home state of South Carolina. And right now, it looks like Haley will stay in the race, whatever happens tonight as we head towards next week's Super Tuesday. On the Democratic side, we'll be playing, paying close attention to uncommitted ballots as President Biden faces off against Dean Phillips. That's because Michigan voters have the choice to cast a vote for neither candidate. Some are checking that box as a way to protest the White House's response to Israel's war in Gaza. I'm hoping this uncommitted vote will at least let him know that in Michigan, his, his, it's not a wrap here, it's not a lock here. We voted uncommitted today, uh, again, to put that pressure on the current administration um, to uh, call for a ceasefire. You see the president yesterday, ice cream comb in hand, talking about a ceasefire, and you think he's responding to the pressure that was building here in Michigan. There's no question in my mind. You voted for Biden in 2020. You just voted for Nikki Haley. Yes. Why didn't you vote for Biden this time? Because I feel it's more important to, at this point to uh, let people know that there is an alternative in the Republican Party. I don't know who I'm going to vote for in uh, uh, November. NBC Shaq Brewster is in Grand Rapids, which is in Kent County. That's where President Biden won in 2020. Uh, Shaq, we just heard from one Biden voter who you spoke to today. And I think I heard him correctly. He said he voted for Haley today, right? Are you seeing a lot of crossing over like that? What are, right. what are voters telling you specifically about their protest vote? Hi uh, there, got it. Yeah, voters are coming today and have been coming today. Now polls are officially closed for various reasons. And you heard that voter there essentially say he plans on, he supported Biden in 2020, but he saw Nikki Haley as a way to stop Donald Trump. And that is something that I heard from a couple of voters here throughout the day at this polling location. The interesting thing is that has been almost part of her closing message here. Nikki Haley was in Grand Rapids just yesterday, and she tried to pair Donald Trump and Joe Biden together, especially with the dissatisfaction that many people have with those two leading candidates. And you heard her say that she doesn't believe that Donald Trump can win. So she was essentially saying, if you don't like your options here, come and support me. That was a message that was successful with some of the people who I talked to today. For others, they said that they went with Donald Trump or they went with Joe Biden for other reasons, Scotty. And we just heard from the chair of the Michigan Republican Party. Here's part of what he said, if we've got it. We've got a presumptive nominee. I think the numbers for Donald Trump tonight are going to be very, very good. Uh, you know, the, uh, what is it? Is it next week? We've got Super Tuesday. Uh, you know, and what we see. Trump has the momentum, national polls, everything indicate that this race is over. Everything that is indicating that this race is over. I mean, is this thing a wrap or is the devil in the details here? The devils are in the details. I mean, this is a nominating process. So this is just one state in a series of states that will determine who the ultimate uh, nominee, Republican nominee will be. But Donald Trump has won every contest up to this point. There's no signs that he is set to lose Michigan or really any other state where there's polling in the future. So I think that expresses and that reflects some of that sentiment that you heard there. But, you know, one thing that we have been following is Michigan does something a little bit differently in in terms of how they allocate those delegates. Uh, Michigan has 55 delegates. Only 16 of them will be allocated based on the results of today's election. All those voters came out, participated. They're only determining about 16 of Michigan's 55 delegates. The remaining 39 delegates, that was quick math right there, the remaining 39 delegates <laughs> will be allocated this weekend at a convention that will be taking place. It will be up to those delegates. They have their own preferences based on congressional districts, and that will be how the rest of the delegates get uh, uh, handed out. The, the impact of that is that despite Despite this primary being wrapped up and despite us having the results or some results come in tonight, we won't know the final delegate picture until much later in the week.
So when it comes to that convention, I mean, so much of this is about the uh, not checking the box for either candidate or these protest votes. But in that convention, is that pretty much a wrap? You know, it's interesting because when you talk to the uh, folks who will be attending it, when you heard from the GOP state party chair there, uh, it, it sounds as if many of those uh, people who will be voting those delegates, they're party insiders. These are, uh, mm -hmm. many of them are Trump loyalists. Many of them have been party officials or involved in the party in various ways. So it is very likely to be an overwhelmingly Trump delegate grab from tonight's uh, from both tonight's primary and that state convention. So it's always, it's always hard to say that it's, uh, you know, a complete wrap. It, it matters what happens. But if you follow the trends, if you listen to what people involved are saying, it does look like uh, we'll be leaving Michigan with or President Trump will be leaving Michigan with a big delegate uh, grab on his path to the nomination. Jack Brewster, live in Grand Rapids, Michigan tonight. We're going to check back with you in just a little bit later this hour. Thanks so much for joining us. So now we have President Biden making some news, saying he hopes a temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas could start as soon as next week. He made that announcement last night during a surprise taping for Late Night with Seth Meyers while the two were doing a bit while eating ice cream. My national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. Uh, maybe by next Monday. Some people in Gaza don't seem to have too much faith in that new deal. Take a listen. Uh, U.S. officials are telling NBC News that during temporary ceasefire deal, they're hoping for the release of more hostages and aid into Gaza, but all of it might be in jeopardy because today both Israel and Hamas seem to be downplaying what Biden said. NBC News foreign correspondent Rolf Sanchez has more. President Biden's hopeful comments that a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas could be reached as early as Monday being met with something like skeptical silence here in the Middle East. Qatar's foreign ministry was asked about the president's remarks earlier, and a spokesman said if there was a breakthrough to be announced, I would look a whole lot more cheerful than I do right now. I spoke to an Israeli official earlier on today, and he said very significant gaps remain between Israel and Hamas, that there would need to be a pretty significant shift in positions if there is going to be a deal by Monday. A couple of the outstanding issues. One, how many Palestinian prisoners Israel would need to release from its jails in order to secure the release of hostages. Hamas initially asking for 1,500 Palestinian prisoners to be released, some of them serving very long sentences for murder, for terrorism. It does appear Hamas has softened that demand somewhat, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under intense pressure from the far right of his government not to make major concessions to Hamas on this issue of prisoners. One possibility that could suffer, could soften the blow politically for Netanyahu is if these inmates who are serving longer sentences go into exile after their release. So rather than going to the occupied West Bank, rather than going to Gaza, they potentially go to Qatar, to Iran, to other countries. The other big question is this issue of whether a ceasefire would be temporary, which is what Israel says needs to happen, or whether this would be a permanent ceasefire to end the war. A senior Hamas official today repeating Hamas's position that any ceasefire has to bring an end to the conflict altogether, the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip, and only then can there be the release of hostages. Not clear if that's political posturing or not, but Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, 
Israel will go into the southern city of Rafah either before a deal or after a deal, but it is going in. That is causing worldwide concern for the fate of those 1.4 million Palestinian civilians who are sheltering in the city, as well as the potential for disruption for the flow of humanitarian aid coming in from Egypt through the Rafah crossing into Gaza. The UN warning an Israeli attack could be the final nail in the coffin for humanitarian efforts in the Strip. Back to you. Ref Sanchez, thanks so much. And turning now to New Mexico, where the trial against the armor on the movie set Rust continues. Today, testimony focused on something that hasn't made headlines before, and it posed this question. What if this was not just a case of who put a live bullet in the gun that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins, or whether Alec Baldwin actually pulled the trigger, but whether first responders could have saved Hutchinson's life, if not for a big mistake? That's what the defense tried to convince the jury of today. And listen closely to what the medical examiner who performed Hutchinson's autopsy said on the stand. The intubation was actually in the wrong place. It was in the esophagus. It was removed when she arrived at the hospital, but she was also re-intubated into her esophagus and not into the airway. Now, an esophageal intubation can be a dangerous situation, correct? Uh, it's, it's an ineffective um, way to respirate someone. And so by putting it in the esophagus, that is basically sending uh, oxygen into the stomach. Yes. Had Ms. Hutchins received more timely medical intervention, could she have possibly survived these wounds? That's difficult for me to answer that question. When you were interviewed, didn't you say she possibly could have survived? Potentially, but I'm not the best person to ask for that question because I don't treat patients. Okay, but you previously had said that. You acknowledged yes. that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Prosecutors say the armor Hannah Gutierrez Reed was responsible for the live rounds that were in the gun. Alec Baldwin says he was holding when it went off. She's been charged with manslaughter and tampering with evidence and faces up to 18 months in prison. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin is outside the courthouse in Santa Fe where she has been covering this trial since day one. She joins us now. Dana, uh, so much of this trial has focused on Hannah Gutierrez Reed's possible negligence, but today uh, the defense really highlighting the alleged mistakes made by first responders, right? So uh, could this potentially help yeah. her case? I think that it sows doubt in maybe jurors' minds or it just gives them something a little extra to think about when they're thinking about convicting her of these charges, but I don't think it absolves her of these charges. Remember, as you said, she's charged with involuntary manslaughter because investigators say she was negligent and she did not do her job as an armorer, which led to the death of Helena Hutchins. The autopsy, the woman who performed the autopsy also said that this was an accident. No one has questioned that this was an accident, but it doesn't mean that negligence was not involved. So I think that it may provide a different perspective or it may make them think, hmm, that's interesting. It was interesting to hear. But as she mentioned, she said previously that she thought Helena Hutchins could have possibly survived. But today on the stand, she made it clear that she cannot give that sort of assessment because it's, it's out of her purview. So today on the stand, she did not say whether or not that could have saved Helena Hutchins's life or that Helena Hutchins had a possibility of survival. Gotti. And I know we had a ballistics expert on the stand speaking again today. So much of this comes down to whether the trigger was pulled. Uh, any update on that? Yeah, so he, in his opinion, he said that there were only two things that could have happened in this case. That Alec Baldwin, who was holding that revolver, either pulled the hammer and pressed that trigger or he had the trigger already depressed, and when he let go, that could have caused the gun to fire. In his opinion, he believes that this gun was not modified, it was not broken on the set, therefore, if it was in working condition, then it is likely that it could have fired. And there were even questions about whether he pulled it in a certain fashion. Could it have gotten caught on something on his jacket? And that expert said it could not. Gotti? Dana Griffin, thanks so much.
And tonight, 41 million Americans are under a severe storm watch, strong winds, large hail, even a few tornadoes. And they're all threatening the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and the Ohio Valley. And a lot of it having to do with this unusually high temperature that we've been seeing. More than 100 temperature records fell yesterday. And today, Detroit broke its record high for February. And this is just a look at how people are dressed out there in Chicago. Shorts. And bikes, these are the highs clocked at about 75 today. That's something that we haven't seen for quite some time. So let's bring in NBC News' correspondent, Adrian Broaddus from Chicago. Uh, Adrian, I don't know if you're wearing shorts under there, but uh, it does seem like it's unseasonably warm out in Chicago. What's going on? Hey there, Gotti. No shorts, but I also don't have on gloves, a hat, or even a coat. Normally when you see me, I'm bundled up in layers. That is not the case today. We even saw folks taking a dip in Lake Michigan earlier in the morning. But right now, it's what I like to call the calm before the storm. Just a short time ago, we were with the National Weather Service Chicago, and the team there is preparing to track the severe weather throughout the night. Now, they're always staffed 24 seven, but because of this powerful storm system that's passing through the Midwest, including here in Chicago, they have extra crews and teams working. Their main concern, hail. We're talking about hail, they say, the size of the golf, uh, size of golf balls. Not only the hail, but possible tornadoes happening overnight across the Midwest, including here in the Illinois area. Right now in Chicago, there's a wind advisory and a tornado watch. Gotti? Wow. And overall, so these temperatures, we're not going to see them tomorrow, right, or, or throughout the week. What's it going to look like a little bit later? So our teams have been calling it weather whiplash. We're going to see a dramatic drop in temperature, at least 40 to 60 degrees. The high today here in some parts of Chicago, 77. Tomorrow, it's going to fall to about 27 degrees. And then on Thursday, we will see the temperature start to climb again. Thursday and on Friday, we could be up to 50 degrees. But it's this swing and temperature that creates that danger element, Gotti. 74 today, 27 tomorrow. That is wild. NBC's Adrian brought us. Thank you so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. We're keeping a close eye on the election results coming out of Michigan right now. We're going to bring you those as soon as we get them. Plus, we told you about a deep fake pornography of celebrities like Taylor Swift. Well, now middle school students are creating fake content of their classmates. I'm going to tell you more about the disturbing trend, and that's all just ahead, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back, and here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Two men have been found guilty in the killing of hip-hop legend Jam Master J. The Run DMC co-founder was killed in his New York City recording studio back in 20, oh, 2002, and the two men faced at least 20 years behind bars and a potential life sentence. Now, prosecutors have declined to seek the death penalty against them. And the clock's ticking for Congress to keep the government open. Senators from both parties saying today that another short-term funding bill will probably be needed to prevent a partial shutdown this weekend. And fights over certain policy changes are holding up that process. They'll have to agree to something pretty fast, though, because the deadline is Friday night. And Nathan Wade's former divorce lawyer, Terrence Bradley, was back on the witness stand today saying he couldn't remember key details over when Wade and Fannie Willis started dating. He did, however, acknowledge they were together at some point. Now, those details could all determine whether or not Willis will be disqualified from overseeing the Georgia election interference case against former President Trump. Willis has denied any wrongdoing. And Macy's is shutting down 150 of its stores by 2026 as they try to turn around a slump in sales. Instead, they're going to focus on luxury brands Bloomingdale's and Blue Mercury, and they say the closures will help Macy's save about $100 million in costs this year alone. And we're watching wildfires in Texas tonight where they have already caused Governor Greg Abbott to issue a disaster declaration. Right now, the largest fire is tearing through the state's rural panhandle area. And the Texas A&M Forest Service says it's burned through about 300 square miles so far. 
And you can call this next story the ultimate supermarket sweep. Some of the biggest grocery stores are busy trying to buy each other. Kroger and Albertsons are in the middle of this $25 billion merger, or at least they were until the government tried to stop it with a lawsuit. The Federal Trade Commission filed a lawsuit along with eight other states saying that they are worried the merger will only lead to sky-high grocery prices. Now, Kroger is like the second largest grocery giant in the U.S. and owns all of these chains like Ralph's and Smith's. We're talking three thousand stores and Albertsons is the fourth largest with chains like Safeway and Vons. They've got about 2,000 stores, which means if they combine, they would have control over a huge chunk of the market and could drive up prices. But Kroger and Albertsons say stopping the merger will also benefit other grocery giants like Walmart and Costco. It is pretty complicated. So let's break it down with NBC News business correspondent Brian Chung. Brian, so for the sake of our grocery bills, let's just game out these two scenarios here. First, what could happen to our bills if a deal does go through? Well, if it does go through, what uh, the two companies are saying, Kroger and Albertsons, is that they'll be able to offer better deals to consumers. And that's because they won't have to deal with the cost of redundant stores in certain areas. So let me put us an example, right? So we know that there is a Vons on Fairfax Boulevard, right? Just up on, uh, on Fairfax, you know that uh, there is a, let's say, for example, a Ralph's, right? If those two stores are in the same area and this merger happens, does the company need to operate both of them in the same area? Well, maybe not. So they would make perhaps close one, keep the other one open. The FTC, though, says, well, hold up, pause. If you close one of those stores, then there's not going to be competition in the area. So the quality is going to go down and maybe the prices go up. But the companies are saying, well, we'll have the cost savings of not having to operate the other store on the other side of the block so we can actually keep prices lower. So it's a little bit of a he said, she said situation. But again, while this is going through litigation, because now that it's going to the courts, it's going to be up to a judge or maybe a jury to decide decide whether or not this deal ultimately goes through. The game plan is for them to still merge. It just depends on how long this, this would be of a roadblock in that process. And what happens if this deal is killed forever? If forever? Any implications there? Does this set a precedent? Yeah, well, we heard from Kroger and Albertson saying that if the FTC has its way by trying to stop this merger, if they succeed, what that would do is increase the market concentration for other big players in the grocery space. And they pointed and specifically named the likes of Walmart, the likes of Costco, the likes of Amazon. So they're saying the FTC, which ironically is trying to stop consolidation in this space, might actually be helping the big guys get bigger. Now, you'll notice that the names that I threw out there, they're not just singularly grocery chains, right? Walmart, Amazon, they sell plenty of other types of things, Costco as well. So it's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison. But again, this is an issue now that the FTC has put that lawsuit out there along with eight other states. It's going to be up to a judge and jury to try to figure out whether or not this merger, if it goes through, would be an antitrust concern. Brian Chung, thanks so much. Now, I don't know about you, but middle school, not the best memories for a lot of us, right? Well, imagine if AI was thrown into the mix. In some cases, students now are starting to use deep fake images to take bullying to a whole new level. And NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has that disturbing story. It's the latest incident of a new and insidious form of bullying. A group of students at a Beverly Hills middle school creating deep fake pornographic images of their classmates, swapping the faces of their peers onto pictures of nude bodies. I'm very disappointed. The school alerting parents after the images were shared among students via text. Beverly Hills police are now assisting in the investigation. This is a new unchartered territory when it comes to um, uh, information that's being you know, created and disseminated. The disturbing incident happening just weeks after fake nude images of Taylor Swift appeared online. District Superintendent Michael Bragge sees a connection. I do believe that that played a, a big part in our students becoming aware of what's possible with the technology. This technology is easy to use and so easily accessible. They can get it right on their phones, instantaneously create content, and then send it anywhere. AI still so new, this all falls into a legal gray area. Experts say it's still unclear if the fake images are even child pornography. Why are there not more legal protections to prevent this type of incident from happening right now? This is one of the situations where law is oftentimes chasing after technology. A federal bill aims to criminalize sharing sexually explicit deepfake photos, but it's stalled in Congress. Images 
can last forever. Ever. Yeah. If your image is already being flawed at this young age, it can really have an impact on their mental health. Parents tell us it's an issue that cannot wait. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Horrible. And coming up, all eyes are on Michigan tonight as the final polls close in the state. Just 30 minutes away from now, we're going to bring you some special coverage from the ground. But first, you've got to see this. This is one of the rarest sights on Earth. That, my friends, that's a fireball. And it's not actually a fire. It's a phenomenon that's a uh, horse tail falls in Yosemite here in California. It happens uh, only around this time of year. And only if the weather is just right and the sun hits the waterfall in just the perfect place. It legit looks like lava is spewing down El Capitan. That you is lit. I'll be right back. And some polls in Michigan have already closed, and we're about 30 minutes away from polls in the rest of the state wrapping up. Today, Republicans cast their ballots in the first of two contests happening this week. The biggest pot of delegates is actually up for grabs on Saturday when the state will host dueling conventions after a dispute between two Republican leaders. It gets a little confusing, so NBC News anchor Hallie Jackson explains. For Michigan Republicans, a tale of two conventions with plenty of drama. Voters in Tuesday's GOP primary will only determine 16 delegates, not even half of the 55 in play. The rest of the delegates set to be picked at Saturday's state conventions. Yes, conventions, plural. Why? Partly because Democrats wanted their primary in February, moving it up after Joe Biden's key win there in 2020. But Michigan's Republicans wanted to keep theirs in March, coming up with this hybrid model. Here's where things get messy, because two people say they're the Republican leader in Michigan. Former Congressman Pete Huckstra and Christina Caramo picked to run the party at first, then ousted over her handling of it. But so far, Caramo refuses to leave. Both have their own websites, their own loyalists, and now their own conventions. Caramo has an edge with a hold over the party's infrastructure. She still also controls the email address, the bank accounts, the, the property of the Michigan Republican Party. Until that's resolved, makes it very hard for Pete Huckstra to do anything. Huckstra's argument? He's the only one who has the Republican National Party's blessing. They went through the appropriate process. Their recognition and their election of me to be the Michigan State Party chair is legitimate. And it's not like this is some MAGA versus anti-Trump fight either. I said, you think you could ever get this guy hoaxed? He's unbelievable. But even though Caramo backed Donald Trump's lies about voter fraud in the 2020 election, she says it's not up to him. Love the guy, but that's not his decision to make. Messy, messy. And our friend, the one and only Hallie Jackson, joins us now. Uh, Hallie, a, a local judge just weighed in on all this, right? Yeah. What was the rule? You Listen, Gotti, you said it, messy, messy, except now a judge is trying to de-messify it, if you will, clean it up a little bit by ruling against the woman that you just saw in that piece, Christina Caramo, basically issuing what's called a temporary injunction. It means she no longer, you know, should have access to this Republican state party, the, the, the phone chain, the documents, et cetera, essentially saying that, like, yes, it's Pete Hoekstra who does have control of the state Republican Party here. So a bit of a late-breaking development tonight but it may help give some clarity as we round the corner into Saturday when those dueling conventions were supposed to be held. It is not clear tonight if, in fact, Caramo, after this judge's ruling, will, in fact, move forward with that dueling convention. But it is clear with the Republican Party aligned behind Hoekstra, with former President Trump behind him, he is out with a statement tonight, essentially saying that everybody has reviewed it. There is unanimous agreement that the former chair, meaning Caramo, was properly removed. He says it's time to unite and move forward with the business of delivering the state of Michigan for the what he describes as presumptive nominee, former President Trump. Of course, Gotti, Donald Trump is not the presumptive nominee, at least not yet. He has not hit that magic delegate number that he needs, but he is obviously sailing to the nomination based on what we've seen so far. No indication that Michigan tonight will be any different for him, Gotti. Uh, what does this say about the Republicans' leadership in that state uh, when it comes to Trump? So it's important, right? Because as we pointed out in that story, this isn't like, uh, it's not like there's one person who is sort of pro-Donald Trump and one person who is anti-Trump, right? Like that was not the case. That's not the that's not the situation here. Both of these people were obviously behind former President Trump. Um, but it, 
what's more important is why this matters for the party's organization moving forward into November, right? So Donald Trump came out, and as we said, he backed, he, you saw it there, he backed Tuckstra. He has had, you know, given given his support to this to this chair. Um, the, the reason why this matters is former President Trump lost the state of Michigan to President Biden by only about 150,000 points last election, Gotti. Michigan, I don't have to tell you, is a key swing state. It is so critical come November. And the party apparatus matters as far as things like the get out the vote operation, as far as things like the turnout operation that is going to be a big deal as we round the corner into the fall here. And so that is why you want to have a party apparatus in place that can function, that is not tied up in these sort of messy disputes, if you will. Obviously, we still have months to go before November actually comes, but that is where the rubber meets the road as far as this kind of thing is concerned for former President Trump. Yeah, one party apparatus, not two different ones. I can imagine your laptop right there with both <laughs> with both convention websites still up, refreshing both of them. Um, based on what you've seen so far, does it look like there might be some sort of last ditch appeal before these two conventions this weekend? TBD, it's a great question. Um, you know, our colleague Henry Gomez has been the tip of the spear in our reporting on this tonight uh, and throughout the course of this process. You saw him there in that story, in fact. Um, and so it is potentially, you know, possible. The thing is, you got to look at where the party apparatus is, right? And I, I know I keep saying, but like, who's in her corner moving forward here? And with former President Trump specifically kind of throwing his weight behind Hoekstra, that remains to be seen. That is a question mark. Obviously, if these dueling conventions happen, they're going to have to figure that out and sort it out. The hope, I would assume, for Michigan Republicans is that they get that figured out before the fall got. And just when you thought primaries were confusing enough, something like this happens. NBC News' anchor Hallie Jackson, thanks so much for being with us. And let's go back to Shaq Brewster in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Battleground Brewster, uh, Michigan, in-person voting for the first time. How do you think that's going to affect the reporting uh, of results tonight? Well, it's not clear exactly how it will affect the reporting of the results, but you know, you mentioned this is the first time that Michigan has Michiganders have had the opportunity to participate in early voting in a no excuse kind of way. And according to the Secretary of State's office, they took advantage of that. More than one million ballots were cast before polling locations opened this morning. The vast majority of those were by mail, but about 78,000 people went to early voting locations uh, the, in per, to vote in person before uh, election day. So those ballots, uh, they're allowed to be processed. That was another change that has taken place in Michigan since the 2020 election. Um, so we can expect to see those results processed fairly quickly. But the Secretary of State in a press conference earlier today also warned that it may take some time for some counties to report out those results. She's saying that we might not get full unofficial results for some places until tomorrow morning. That's unrelated to the new process, but it's just the reality of the time in which it takes some of the counties to count those ballots. And check a little bit earlier in the hour, we we're listening to voters, uh, Democrat voters, and what they thought of President Biden. What are Republican voters saying about the former president? Because he's he's the clear front runner, right? Yeah, and it really depends on who you talk to. I think out of all the Republican voters I talked to today, they were clear eyed about his status, that he is the front runner. They see that he's won all the contests so far. They see that he's ahead in the polling. But despite that, you had many of them coming out to either stop that or to support that. I want you to listen to some of the conversations I had with folks today. Will these criminal indictments impact the way you think about Trump at all? No, not at all. Why not? Um, it's kind of been a witch hunt since the beginning, so I figured, you know, they're never going to stop trying with anything. We've seen Haley's been slowly gaining momentum, um, and I think she's a much, a much better choice for the country than Donald Trump would be. So you see that individual, that last individual there, he says that he would likely support President Biden in November, but he came out today to vote for Nikki Haley as a way to stop Donald Trump. You heard some of those examples over the course of the day. But again, among Republicans, they understand the reality here. You hear that even with the Haley campaign, they know that she's fighting an uphill battle. But for so many who are voting for her, it's about being able to have their say, despite what some may perceive as the writing being on the wall.
And speaking of Nikki Haley, she's already on to Super Tuesday, right? Here's some of what she said earlier today in Colorado about the Trump effect in Michigan. Let's take a look. I came from Michigan, where in 2012, they were a beacon of light. They were winning races up and down the ticket. They had passed a white, uh, right to work law. Everybody was looking at Michigan. And when I was there this week, They've lost the governor's mansion. They've lost the state house. They've lost the state senate since Donald Trump was president. Okay, so the question I have is, how does the state of Michigan's Republican Party compare with the state of the Republican Party overall? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting there, especially with the chaos that you were talking about with yeah. Hallie just before <laughs> this segment. This was a well-run party. This is a party that was a prime example that other Republicans in other states look to. And you see the point that Nikki Haley was making that she blames Donald Trump for the degradation of that. And I think, you know, when you look at the Republican Party across the country, yes, not all of them are operating under the same level of chaos that this party is. But uh, there is that distinction and there is another point to be made about Donald Trump's command over it. Just like here, despite that back and forth, despite the disputes over who was leader, at the end of the day, it was the person who Donald Trump wanted to be, the, who, the person who Donald Trump endorsed to be the state party chair. He is now fully in control of the state party. And you're seeing Donald Trump being able to uh, have his support uh, and have his preferred candidates uh, among Republican parties across the country. So I think if you were to compare the Republican Party here to the Republican Party across the country, you see Donald Trump's influence and his imprint on both, Gotti. Jack Brewster, thanks so much. And now back to Biden. As the sitting president and incumbent for the Democrats, you, you'd think that Biden uh, wouldn't be facing any major challenges tonight, but this is 2024 and things, as you've seen, are very complicated. So here's a word that you've probably heard a lot. We've been talking about it a lot tonight, uncommitted, as in I came to cast my ballot, but I still don't know who I'm going to vote for uncommitted. And that is what's happening in Michigan in something known as the uncommitted movement that's causing some ripples in those Biden waters. Some Michigan voters are planning to check the uncommitted box to protest his administration's response to the Israel-Hamas war. And their goal is to get to at least 15 percent, which would deny the president a delegate at the Democratic National Convention this summer. Here's how one voter in Dearborn explained it. And I think that the president should listen to us and the Democratic Party should listen to us when we tell them that here in Michigan, Gaza is a top issue. President Biden needs every vote he can get, he, he can get here in Michigan. And if he doesn't change his Gaza policy, he will be handing the, uh, the, the presidency to Donald Trump. That's certainly not something that I want personally. So let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Mimley, who is in Dearborn, Michigan. Mike, uh, let's talk about this uncommitted protest vote uh, from some Democrats. E even Dearborn's mayor is going to be voting uncommitted or said he was going to be voting uncommitted, right? He announced his plan in this op-ed in The New York Times. So who's behind this movement and, and how much support did you see it have today at the polls? Well, Gotti, this is so interesting, right? I have covered five presidential campaigns, and this is the first time I've ever gone to an election night party, not for a candidate, but for uncommitted. This is the effort to show really essentially a protest vote for President Biden's foreign policy. And there are some establishment, you could call them establishment, the mayor here from Dearborn, former Congressman Andy Levin, uh, the Bernie Sanders political organization, Our Revolution, they have put their voice behind it, as has Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib from this district. But this really has been a grassroots effort. They don't have a lot of money. They haven't been able to spend a lot. They haven't been able to put uh, any uh, TV ads on the air in the way that the Biden campaign campaign has been able to do. And so the fact that they are seeing this kind of success, their votes are just coming in now. They already have over 15 percent of the vote so far, well ahead of what the expectations they were trying to set. They said they would consider this a success if they got 10,000 votes. Well, this it's pretty early in the night, Gotti, and they've already well surpassed 10,000 votes. Yeah, I mean, like time out, because uh, let me just clarify what you said. You're not at a Democrat party. You're not at a Republican party. Mm -hmm. This is a primary night. You were at an uncommitted party? That's, that's what you said? 
It's an uncommitted party, and I got to say, as parties go, it's pretty good. They've got a nice food spread here. They got a, a big crowd, bigger than I think even <laughs> they expected. Now, I should mention, I went to a write-in campaign party earlier in New Hampshire. Remember, Joe Biden wasn't on the ballot there, so this is already a pretty unusual cycle. Uh, but this really does demonstrate what they think is a significant movement to put some pressure on the president. The big question, Gotti, is will the voters who cast an uncommitted ballot tonight vote in November? Will they vote for Joe Biden in November? Will they vote for a third party candidate? We heard a little bit of everything from the voters we talked to today. The Biden campaign says, listen, this is a choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in November, and they're confident voters will make the judgment that Joe Biden, even with some disagreements on the, the, the policy yeah, level, uh, is better for their interests than Donald Trump. Yeah, but, uh, you know, from an outsider looking yeah, over there, it does look like Biden's kind of left his campaign in Michigan largely to his surrogates, right? What, what's been his strategy there? We haven't seen him on the ground there very much. And, and how are the surrogates doing? Yeah, that's right. We've only seen President Biden come here to Michigan just once, didn't hold a big rally. He did, you know, some meetings with union workers. Union support has been so critical for President Biden. But the campaign here, such as it is, has really been carried by Michigan's Democratic governor, Christian Whitmer. She is a co-chair of the Biden campaign. Her political organization has done more than two dozen events over the past month alone all across the state. Now, the Biden campaign is really dependent on that support uh, and that infrastructure, frankly, because they haven't built it up yet. And there's been some questions from Michigan. Michigan Democrats who say this is a swing state. You better be on the ground in a much bigger way ahead of November. Every worker uh, is his campaign trying to manage expectations a little bit tonight? Human life. Yeah, and, and some of the points that we're hearing from them, Gotti, are to look at what past Michigan primaries specifically have seen in terms of this uncommitted vote. We saw, for instance, 20,000 uncommitted votes in the 2020 Democratic primary when you did have a competitive top of the ticket with Joe Biden running against Bernie Sanders. In 2016, when Hillary Clinton was running against Bernie Sanders, again, there were 20,000 uncommitted votes. And so you have seen on a percentage basis that there are uh, – typically see this kind of uncommitted vote in the past. Past, but it's just a much more significant number so far based on what is an organized, uncommitted effort rather than just leaving it to the voters. I, I mean, I, sorry, Mike, but you're doing the, the good old fashioned lowering of the voice because somebody is on the microphone talking because you're at a primary party and, and you'd think that it was either a Dem or a Republican. I just can't get over the fact that you're at an uncommitted party. So I got to ask, sorry to ask this, but what you were saying that they have a great food spread. What do the uncommitted voters eat? Like, is it a big buffet of choices? You vote uncommitted. Well, this is a Middle Eastern restaurant, so there are some excellent hummus. Wine. I haven't had a chance to sample it myself yet, uh, but wine. they have some other dishes. They also do have a campaign listen, staple, boxes of pizza. We always know, especially reporters, about election night pizza. <laughs> Uncommitted until it comes to pizza. NBC's Mike Memoli. Thanks so much for joining us. Today. And Republican candidate Nikki Haley says she is not going anywhere, at least not yet, even though if she winds up losing tonight, it'll be her fifth straight loss in a major nominating contest against Donald Trump. Take a look. 70% of Americans have said they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I am giving them a choice. We don't anoint kings in America. We allow people to vote in elections, and that's what we've done. In the next 10 days, 21 states and territories will vote. That's a great thing about America, and I think everybody deserves competition. Now, Haley has promised to stay in the race through Super Tuesday on March 5th when those 15 states, including California, hold their primary. So let's bring in NBC's senior political editor, Mark Murray. Uh, Mark, Nikki Haley, she's really been playing into the fact that she's an alternate option, not just to Trump, but also to Biden. Does, does Michigan being an open primary help her tonight? Yeah, so potentially it does help her. And Michigan being an open primary means that Democrats, Republicans, independents can kind of pick any primary they want to be able to participate in. And obviously that was something that benefited her in South Carolina, where in addition to getting almost 40 percent of the primary vote in the, her home state, there were a lot of crossover Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents who ended up boosting her total. And she could potentially see the same thing happen in Michigan if there are some Democrats 
Democrats who say, hey, I want to participate to make Donald Trump look bad. On the other hand, Gotti, uh, we are seeing the same, uh, you know, the Democratic primary play out on the Democratic side. And so for Democrats who want to express support for President Biden or that uncommitted that Mike Memley was just talking about, that might actually take away some of the potential crossover voters that she was getting in South Carolina and maybe make it just a little bit harder for her in Michigan than she was able to get 40 percent in South Carolina over the weekend. And if Haley doesn't do super great tonight and doesn't do super great in whatever chaos this weekend brings, uh, what's her path forward? It's a really difficult path, Gotti. And, you know, one of the things you have to understand about the delegate rules in the Republican race is that in a lot of ways, when it comes to Super Tuesday, many of them are almost kind of like a winner take all if a candidate gets 50 percent or more. And, you know, Democrats, they like to divide up their delegates proportionally. If you end up getting 15 or 20 percent, you get 15 or 20 percent of the delegates. That's probably not going to weigh it's going to be in most contests on the Republican side. And so we just saw in South Carolina, for example, Nikki Haley ended up getting nearly 40 percent of the vote last Saturday, only ended up getting three delegates. And so if you kind of extrapolate that out, that could actually be very difficult. And so by the time you get to Super Tuesday or the middle of March, Donald Trump could be in a position of wrapping up the Republican nomination just on the delegates alone. And I mean, running for office costs a lot of money and we're starting to see some of that funding dry up. It if Nikki Haley does drop out of the race, what do you think would push her to do that? What would be the straw that, that breaks the back here? Yeah, and Gotti, usually his money, that you end up running out of money, or you actually realize that there is no, there is no path to either winning the nomination or even winning some of the states. And as you ended up mentioning, if she ends up losing in Michigan tonight, that will be the fifth consecutive uh, primary or caucus contest that she has lost to Donald Trump. And she ends up saying that she wants to continue through Super Tuesday to give voice to voters to, who want to participate in the process and who might not like either Donald Trump or President Joe Biden. But by the time we get to Super Tuesday, you'll have uh, about half of the delegates who are already awarded, half the country potentially already voting. And what is notable about Nikki Haley is she hasn't necessarily set out a plan plan after Super Tuesday. So to me, it, the end of the road very well could end on March 5th on Super Tuesday for her campaign. Are you anticipating any surprises on Super Tuesday? You know, Gotti, we've been doing this for a long time, and I think it's always important for political reporters and analysts to always be on the lookout for surprises. It was just in 2016, this very Democratic uh, uh, Michigan primary on the Democratic side when Bernie Sanders ended up upsetting uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, there are sometimes black swan events in our politics. Uh, I think we should always be open to surprises. But what is happening in these Republican races right now is that Donald Trump is winning the overwhelming majority of Republican primary voters. Uh, Nikki Haley's doing better at, with independents and crossover Democrats. But if you just extrapolate that out to the Republican electorate at large, that's very difficult for Nikki Haley. Uh, are, do you think that Nikki Haley voters may end up voting for, for Biden when it comes to November? Uh, so I think we have some evidence that while there are uh, true Republicans who prefer Nikki Haley over Donald Trump, in South Carolina on Saturday, we ended up seeing people who seem to be fitting the profile more of a, a Democratic voter or certainly an anti-Trump voter participating. And so I do think part of her coalition, obviously, are Republicans who just prefer a different, uh, who want an alternative to Donald Trump. But a lot of the coalition that is backing her are crossover Democrats and, and independents who lean to the Democratic Party who probably aren't Donald Trump voters in the first place. And great perspective there. Mark Murray, thanks so much for joining us. And let's bring in Democratic strategist Amisha Cross and Republican strategist Brendan Buck. Uh, thank you both for joining us tonight. For, for the Democrats, how many uncommitted ballots would actually raise red flags for the White House here? And for, for Republicans, how big of a vulnerability could this be for the president? Uh, Amisha, let's start with you. 
Well, we know that there has been a coordinated effort to increase uncommitted votes, um, particularly coming from um, a, a population that has a large percentage of Palestinians and Muslim identifying uh, voters. That makes a difference. I think that for Joe Biden, the awareness here is you have over 25 percent even. It doesn't have to be a number that completely topples um, the general electorate in Michigan. But if it is one that is over an abysmal number, I think that that raises alarm because we're looking at the fact that this it's a long long haul to November. And the only thing that could happen is more ratcheted up attacks. And I say that because we know that the president has already acknowledged that um, the possibility of maybe a ceasefire happening by the end of the week. I don't think anybody believes that that's uh, a possibility, knowing how Hamas works and knowing where Bibi Netanyahu stands. However, I do think that there is a lot of campaign left. And right now, uh, what we're seeing in Michigan is going to be a bellwether for many other states, particularly those with more um, with more Muslim populations and those, I also believe, with younger voters. And, Brendan, do you think that the... Pres uh, former President Trump is going to capitalize on, on what we're seeing here with the uncommitted vote? Absolutely not. It would be hard. It would be hard to imagine how he would. This is the same President Trump who literally um, castigated all black people over this past weekend, um, it, it, basically amounting them all to criminals with mugshots. Uh, I, I think that there is a significant difference, um, whether a lot of commentators would like to have that conversation or not, between what we've seen with former President Trump and President Biden, and that that uncommitted vote would not be an uncommitted vote that automatically would turn to Donald Trump. I think the greater fear is that that uncommitted vote would not come out to vote at all. What do you think, Brendan? Do you agree there? Yeah, so look, uh, uh, Joe Biden won Michigan uh, last time by about 150,000 votes, not a lot. Um, and on the pace that they are, are at tonight, it could be close, could be over 100,000 people who, who don't show up. Leave that aside, there's already polling showing Donald Trump consistently in polls winning Michigan. Um, you know, this is a, a state and, and a region that Rust Belt, the Democrats have said, you know, they really want to win all of those Midwest states to, as, as a defense uh, against Trump. Um, but Michigan could be the, the big problem for them there. And it makes it, uh, opens up a lot more possibilities for, um, for, for Donald Trump, different map options to be there. Yeah, I mean, this is not necessarily about people uh, voting for Donald Trump. It's just about not showing up. And obviously, this is perhaps a population that's a single issue, single issue voters, and, and they care about this more than anything. But you're also seeing throughout the Democratic Party a number of, of demographics that are just showing a level of apathy that is really concerning if you're if you're the White House. Uh, young voters, in, in particular, not as excited about uh, the Democratic nominee as they typically are. So they need to find some way to get Democrats more uh, enthusiastic about this uh, election. And maybe this sign, you know, this this opportunity in the primary that really is just a protest does serve as, as a chance for them to, to mend some fences there and, and be in better shape come, come November. Now, one of the biggest surrogates, obviously, is Michigan's governor, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. She told us about the president's handling of the Israel-Gaza conflict as she saw it yesterday. Let's take a quick listen to that. I have spoken with the president. I've spoken with a lot of people about it. And I keep very close with our Arab American community. Um, I understand that, you know, there is a lot of different feelings on this and strong ones and pain that people are feeling. And yet I also know that we have a president who is working 24 seven to try to bring calm to the region and peace to the region. He is, I think, working incredibly hard to resolve what is happening. Amisha, first to you, what do you make of her assessment there? I think that it was honest. We're talking about the leader of uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, Democratic uh, Democratic Party in the nation. We were talking about the Michigan Democratic Party. In addition to that, I think that she is very aware of what's happening on the ground. Not only does Michigan have a very strong and vibrant Arab community, it also has a very vibrant Jewish community. So she has had to be on the forefront of a lot of these issues, facing it head on within her state. And I think that she's being very strategic about her words here because she's acknowledging that President Biden has changed his tone and temperament around 
Israel over the past few weeks, particularly acknowledging what he's heard from, um, from, from Palestinian populations, from Arab populations in the United States, but also from what we've seen on the ground, the images that are coming out of Gaza, the displacement, the brutality, the deaths. And I think that those things matter. And he is being attentive to and, and paying attention very closely to what's happening and devising policy ideas and plans that make sense in construct with the changing and evolving processes on the ground, particularly the egregiousness that Netanyahu seems to continue to display. And, and Brendan, just, you know, very bluntly, what is the, the Republican message to those voters or, or what is former President Trump's message to those voters? Yeah, I don't know. Quite frankly, I'm not sure he would... has to have one. Uh, President uh, Trump uh, is not uh, trying Amisha, sorry. to I, let, let me just, I asked Brendan. Uh, 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 go ahead, Brendan. <laughs> no, I actually agree. I, I don't know that Donald Trump really needs to get involved. You know, when, you're, when your opponents are struggling and they don't really have a way out, you probably don't need to insert yourself. Now, I don't know if Donald Trump is, is disciplined enough uh, to do that and, and to stay out of it. Look, if I'm Democrats, what I don't understand you know, why, they're, why they're not doing it, I guess they don't need my advice, but I don't understand why they're not drawing a bigger contrast with Donald Trump. They're allowing this issue to really be a referendum on Joe Biden's handling of it. And, and they've talked a lot about wanting this election to be a choice, and I don't hear much about that here. You especially don't want a, a referendum on your policy here when so much of it is out of your control. I mean, so much of it is, is you know, going to be decided by, by foreign powers. So th if I were Democrats, I'd be looking to make this a little bit more of a choice election on this issue um, rather than just saying, are you happy with how things are going? Fascinating point. Brendan Buck and Amisha Cross, thank you both for joining us tonight. And with that, we're running out of time here. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Our special coverage of the Michigan primaries continues next with Tom Yachts. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.